Hello and welcome. I hope you're having a good day and today I'm going to explain to you how scientists got from the old quantum theory to what is called the new quantum theory. Some people use those terms, not everybody. So around 1900, Max Planck used this idea of his to explain black body radiation. And I won't talk about black body radiation, but in the future I may do another video on that. And his idea was that things come in lumps. Not everything is completely continuous, right? So by continuous, I mean this is a continuous line I'm drawing, but things aren't actually that way. Things are actually discrete. There's, a, you know, this line is made up of very, very small dots that are discrete. So he said things come in lumps, or the lumps, another name for lumps, is quanta. One quanta is a quantum. And that's where we get the name quantum theory or quantum mechanics. It's the theory of things coming in lumps. Now, around 1905... Einstein came along and borrowed Planck's idea that things come in lumps to say that light comes in lumps. And he said the energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the light nu. So I should mention Planck had this constant h and it was six, about 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds. So now, before Einstein, light was thought of as mostly waves. Now, after Einstein, light was more and more thought of as particles. Because Einstein gave us the term photon. <laughs> so scientists were now switching between thinking about light as waves and thinking about lives as particles. And the way you thought about it made the results of some experiments easier. But really, light is both of these. It's not exactly one or exactly the other. Now around 1910, I talked in a previous video about Niels Bohr, which gave us, <coughs> he gave us the model of the atom that Still, many people think of the atom like this today. So the picture you see with the small nucleus and the discrete orbitals around that nucleus, it's like if you Google the word science, I'm sure you'll see that kind of atom. But that's really not how an atom was. That's how the atom was thought of in the old quantum theory. So Bohr gave us that electron orbitals are discrete. And he said the energy of that orbital, let's say the nth orbital, is equal to some constant divided by n squared. And now n can equal 1, 2, 3, it has to be an integer. R is just a constant. And this was for the hydrogen atom. If you wanted to explain any single electron atom, you would just add this factor z squared, where z is equal to the nuclear charge, or how many protons you have. And now be aware that this only worked for only works for one electron atoms and this formula was so this formula was empirical mostly in nature which means it came from experiment using the results of experiment scientists guessed the form th this form here and it turned out to be true, and Bohr explained why. And he also calculated the radius of the hydrogen atom, which is now called the Bohr radius, is 53 picometers, or 53 times 10 to the negative 12 meters. So very small. So that was up to 1910. All these guys together <coughs> developed what some people refer to as the old quantum theory, 
old quantum theory. Now between 1910 and 1920-ish, scientists were focused on World War I. A lot of scientists were very patriotic about their country and had a lot of pride. Einstein was an exception. He was a pacifist. But there were scientists such as Fritz Haber, which developed poisonous gas, and these scientists were using science for evil. And scientists, or science can always be used for good or evil. You have to pick which side you're going to use science for. Now, not all of science halted during World War I, but a lot of it did, because a lot of the scientists' efforts were focused on helping their country win the war. But so around 1920 or so, Louis de Broglie gave us the formula that the momentum of something equals Planck's constant divided by lambda. So we're starting to see more and more scientists use Planck's constant here and use the idea that things come in lumps. And now since the momentum is equal to the mass times the velocity, you can calculate the wavelength of everyday objects, such as a baseball. Now let's do that quick. So if you solve for lambda here, the wavelength, you get the mass times the velocity divided by Planck's constant. I didn't do that right. You get Planck's constant divided by m times v. So, let's do the wavelength of a baseball. Let's say the baseball weighs one kilogram and it's moving 10 meters per second. So we said Planck's constant was about 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 4, 34 joules per second. We're going to divide that. We say the baseball weighs one kilogram and it's moving about 10 meters a second. Let's ignore the 6.6 .6 because we're just thinking order of magnitude here. And you're going to end up getting 10 to the negative 35 meters for the wavelength. So I don't even think anybody knows of anything that small. That is, if you think about an atom, go down to human size to an atom size and then do that same thing except start on the atom size. That's about how small that is. So that's something you're never ever going to notice. And that's why in everyday life we do not realize the wave nature of matter. Because matter mostly, you know, weighs a lot and it's matter's, you know, moving most of the time. Okay. So that gives us a sense of the wavelengths of everyday objects. So now, now is the beginning of what is called the new quantum theory. And really, the two scientists that the most credit is given to for developing the new quantum theory was Schrodinger and Heisenberg. And I'll talk about Schrodinger first. So Schrodinger wrote down this new equation, which was the Hamiltonian of what he called the wave function, psi, this is the Greek letter psi, is equal to the energy, E, times psi. And I'm guessing where he got this from was there is this equation in classical mechanics called the wave equation, which said that the double derivative of something in a particular direction, say the x direction, and we'll say our function's u, is equal to the velocity of that thing squared, of the wave squared, the velocity of the wave squared, is equal to the double time derivative of that thing. So we can see the similarity between these. So this part here corresponds to the Hamiltonian, this H with a little hat on it, 
This part corresponds to psi. This part corresponds to the energy. And this part also corresponds to psi. It just has similarities. They're not exactly the same. But this equation is now known as the Schrodinger equation. And now this thing called psi was called the wave function. And particles were now thought of as having a wave function, or photons were thought of as having a wave function. And this wave function gave you the height of a wave, or the amplitude. And then psi squared, if you squared it, Max Born said nobody knew what this wave function was, but Max Born came along and said if you square that thing, it gives you the probability of something happening. And I'll explain that in later videos more. So that was Schrodinger. Now Heisenberg worked around the same time as Schrodinger. This was around 1925. Let's keep that in mind. So Heisenberg. He gave us the uncertainty principle. Which should really be called the indeterminacy principle because we're certain about everything in our system. But everything in our system cannot be determined. So uncertainty should really be paced with be replaced with indeterminacy. That's how people should think of it. And what it said, what the uncertainty principle said was, there is always uncertainty in a measurement. And the mathematical form of that would be the uncertainty in some variable, say the momentum, times the uncertainty in another variable, say the position, is always greater or equal to h bar over 2, where h bar is Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. So this said, the more you know, so the momentum is just the mass times the velocity, right? So if the more you know how fast something's moving, the less you know where that thing is. The more you know where that thing is, the less you know how fast that thing's moving. So this blew everybody's mind. Still is blowing people's minds today. So in other words, let me restate that. It says the more precisely you know something, the less precisely you know a related thing. Right? Because in our example we said the more precisely you know the position, the less precisely you know the velocity, and vice versa. And now I should also mention that <sighs> So what I wrote on the previous page was that Schrodinger used the wave equation. Well, his equation was a partial differential equation, right? So if you didn't understand the subject of math called partial differential equations, well then, you w weren't really sure what Schrodinger was describing. But Heisenberg used a matrix formulation, a matrix approach. And if you knew linear algebra, you could understand what Heisenberg was saying. So today I've talked about how we got from the old quantum theory to the new. So just to recap, the old quantum theory was developed mostly by Planck, Einstein, and Bohr. And the new thing here was that things come in lumps or things are quantized. But this theory was not perfect because it still did not explain some things, such as the double slit experiment. 
Well, Louis de Broil came along, gave us that, hey, everything has... Everything, including... Um, including matter, comes as also like waves. So I was also going to write here that de Broil. So before him, matter was thought of as particles. After him, matter was thought of as waves. So kind of the exact opposite thing to light. And so the new quantum theory was kind of started by de Broil, and then Schrodinger and Heisenberg came along. And they both used two different mathematical formulations of um, well, the new quantum me or the new mechanics was called the quantum mechanics as opposed to classical mechanics. So I hope you learned something from that. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a good day.